there are no consequences for them being wrong. Yeah. Even if you're right, you have consequences. Certainly everybody in this room has been involved in, in those kinds of deals understands that, that there are consequences even if you're right. Yeah. Even if you're able to prove that, I mean, even, I mean, just look here recently, NDOT had to go back and refight some battles on stuff that had already been approved by the agencies. Yeah. And there were no consequences to the people who filed those lawsuits. I, I think at some point, we've got to start penalizing people who tie up projects which are beneficial to everybody. But the bill does be penalized. It's in, it's in the, the chamber summary here. Uh, we do address the statute of limitations for filing legal challenges. Okay. It shortens that. I don't have the exact time frame on that. And, and, but, but we did try to address that exact issue with loss, multiple lawsuits that hold up projects and, you know, um, and, and addressing the statute. I yeah, yeah I think, I think the, the big thing is, is that when you're building a project, the DOT is the lead sponsor. The National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, as we all know it, is not the enemy. It's just the people that use it as a tool to delay projects and, and starve out funding resources and municipalities are doing bond issuances. And more importantly, I was talking to a guy from, from Skanska uh, last night, huge, huge uh, you know, and, and it's, it's the signal that was sent to the private sector that doesn't want to invest in projects because they don't want to, they don't have the, the resources to marshal for a project that's going to be drawn out for three years. The thing about this is the fish and wildlife agencies, the resource agencies, there's about eight different agencies that have to sign off. And they're not motivated. Their goal is not to build a road project. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's and so this bill, yeah. within 180 days before yeah. what we call a record of decision, those agencies have to be in, in the conversation and have to give their answers yes or no, one way or another. Fine. It's fine if it's no, but tell us why. Don't drag it. And then after the record of decision, when you're getting these permits, Endangered Species Act Section 7 waivers, the 404 yeah. permit with the Army Corps of Engineers, you have to answer within 180 days, or else you start to get money rescinded from, from your budget. And so that is something I will tell you that is as, as uh, forget the two years of funding, that's, a, that's, a, that's an accomplishment in and of itself. That's only half the story. These reforms have sent a signal internationally to big firms and, and to construction companies um, that are willing to, to take risks now because they know that this single regulatory uncertainty drives them away. And this is going to have, yes, we'll do another bill two years from now, and we'll try and marshal some resources to, to but the reforms that are in this thing um, have scared the, 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 the litigation side of the environmental community because they feel like they just lost a huge weapon in their ability to prevent development, which is their ultimate goal. Well, yeah, I mean, clearly you have miscreants in the uh, uh, environmental sector whose goal is... I didn't say miscreants, you said it. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> I, 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 I won't have to. I, I, I feel the, the zeal in your, in your, in yeah, your comments. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we've been involved in a lot of projects, yeah. both private and public, that have been, you know, held up for absolutely ridiculous reasons. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had to, you know, basically schedule muscle bed surveys in the river and things like this, which, you know, people can't believe that we, you know, before you can, yeah. you know, the Corps will hold your permit in abeyance if you don't do stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And even though there's been development in the same spot for a hundred years, they don't care. They looked as as new every impact is a new impact. That's why these and that's, these, that's these that's categorical exclusions, the these CEs that were talked about, yeah. Yeah. those those are hard in judicial review to challenge because they're automatic. Yeah, yeah. That's, the thing. that's good. Yeah. That's good. I yeah. think that goes a long way. Yeah. Well, we run into a, great a lot start. of that. Yeah, it's a great start. It, it, it is. We need and to, again. We need to expand it to uh, other things other than this. Uh, and again, going. this doesn't eliminate the NEPA process or yeah. anything. It just forces people to do their jobs quickly. Yeah. And it can be done. The bridge, again, I'll quote: the bridge in Minneapolis that fell down was up, and people driving across it, 437 days. They didn't skip. They didn't skip the process. The process got done. There were people, people physically, from what I'm told, physically in Washington D.C., walking to people's desks saying, "I need this tomorrow," and just got the process done to make sure that they could build, rebuild that bridge. Because obviously, the economic impact to the city of Minneapolis, to Minneapolis, you say, was massive uh, with with that bridge being out. So it had to be done. So it can work. And I think ultimately why we're able to get a lot of these reviews is we used that example quite a bit and made, and made sure that people that didn't want, we had a lot of pushback on getting these 
things in the bill, keeping them in the bill, and ultimately I think why uh, Ms. Boxer realized they were important is because we could prove that it can be done. She and did it reluctantly. And, and very <laughs> reluctantly. Yes. Very reluctantly. Yeah. And, and the environmental groups were actually running ads against her in California, yeah. believe it or not, running right. ads against Barbara Boxer yeah. in California. I mean, she's been one of their biggest proponents for decades. Yeah, it's yeah. right. very true. That's very true. Good question now, on page two. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. On, on page two of uh, the top, it talks about the uh, single program that focuses on the most critical 222,000 miles of roads in the nation. Are we part of that 222,000 miles? Yes. So uh, just to give you, there's there's 200,000 miles of roads <coughs> in the end, right? A lot of those are local minor collectors, farm to market roads. You have about 5,000 miles of interstate. There's probably going to be another. 200 added on when I-69 is all said and done. Um, yes, uh, the two, basically what that is, is refocusing the federal program to, to the 44,000 miles of interstate and the additional nationwide 200,000 miles of what we call the national highway system, federal which highway. is like the primary arterials, the things that lead up. The, the, the whole idea between that is, even though because of, because of, of Indiana's stewardship of, of its roads and the additional resources able to marshal with, with Macquarie and other things that, that helped with I-69 and a lot of roads, I-69, Indiana is not an island. And, the, and, and, and even though you may have the best interstates in the country, we still need Arkansas and Texas and the rest of them to build their roads as well because interstate commerce doesn't care about state boundaries. And the companies that we represent um, that are looking at relocating here and putting 20, 30,000 person factories in the middle of the middle of the country need to have confidence of the predictability of six states of getting stuff from here to the Port of Golf Port and the Mobile. And so focusing on the federal roads, I-69, North-South Corridor is going to be one of the most efficient ones moving down to, to through Arkansas, through, through New Orleans, and especially with the energy development, not just agriculture, but the energy development as we explore natural gas and other things. Um, it's going to, uh, so that idea is, is before that, you could build local roads, bike paths, you could do all this stuff. And, and the idea was, if it's going to be a federal program, it's going to be a federal program, and we're going to, we're going to make sure that we, we, so yes, I would say that of that 222,000 miles, because of the interstates that traverse this state and because it's so critical with the intermodal hubs of Norfolk Southern and CSX, that the, the focus on freight and the movement of goods and things and, uh, um, and products uh, is, going to be, is going to be a big boon to any, and not just for the roads here, but, but you're also considered, like I said, it's the roads in the, in the, in the, in the immediate periphery, they're going to have a direct impact here. I mean, look at where we are right now. You have three states that are directly impacted by the investment that happens within a 50-mile radius of here. You know, it's not just about Indiana, and that's what, that was our focus. Um, well, I, I, I did, my question had to do with the I-69. You covered it, everything that Early in the in the presentation, you said there's more about 69 we wanted to talk about, other than the Port of Houston and New Orleans uh, and 69. Is everything? Uh, well, I mean, I think from our, from Evansville to Indianapolis, you know, we're we're going to be in pretty good shape. In this area, one of our challenges is going to be is getting a bridge across the river to connect everything together, and that's kind of an preliminary. You know, it's, people have been talking about it. There's and trying to figure out how to make that happen, and that, that's going to be one of the next difficult things to, to get done. But that's a project of regional and national significance. You know, that's something that I know about. I know about the Brent Spence Bridge, the Miller Cross, and the, all those bridges are on the radar. It's something that has to get accomplished if we're going to make ourselves, uh, if we're going to be ready for the kind of the influx. What play does the Chamber then have in the process so far? Where, in your opinion, where are we so far with? with just the, this bridge just in particular. Bridge. Yeah. Well, lucky for us, we don't pick projects, we pick policy, you know, and, we, and, and that's a big thing about this bill, and I'll tell you, and I'm not trying to avoid the question, but this bill devolved much of the responsibility away from the federal government back to the states, because that the decisions made closer to the, the people who are, in, in, in our case, Alex, we have an MPO locally yeah. that covers a yeah. multi-state region. Yeah. Two, two states now, I, I think there could be an argument made going forward that, that perhaps the boundaries of that MPO should be expanded, but you know that's you know that that's a discussion we'll have in the future. But the, the point is, how much in addition to the state DOTs, how much do you see? I, I know there was concerns or things that came up where they were discussion about even eliminating MPOs and having only states do it. Yeah. What, what's your view of that? Well, one of the one of the, the provisions of the bill and. and uh, 
Sean can tell you more about and to preserve the, the 200,000 person threshold by making sure that MPOs are preserved so so the states could ride roughshod over, over, over smaller communities. That was a big deal. But and another thing. That was in the Senate bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Senate bill was going to eliminate. That was one of the things. Which I was against. Yeah, we were against on the House side, and that, did, and that did not happen. Which I, it's, you know, it, it, my feeling is even though we had some difficulty with the Bloomington MPL and I 69, uh, they were saying uh, that, you know, these MPOs should have some input. So anyway, you're right. Yeah, it didn't get eliminated. It was a really minor changes. And the other big thing that we didn't talk about was there's a, a billion dollar program called the TIFIA program. It's the Innovative Financing Program. If we're not going to have enough resources to adequately fund, and if we're not going to raise the gas tax, the idea, or at least not at this point, to find new revenue, it was to use to leverage federal dollars, 12, 15 to 1. So the TIFIA program is what's going to build these bridges. It's, it basically it allows up to 50% of the project can access 30-year treasury bond debt, which right now is around 2.5%, 3%. And you don't have to pay that money back until five years after the project is completed. That's how the Tappan Sea Bridge in New York is being built. That's how big, multi-billion dollar projects are being financed now. It used to only be 33% of the project, and there was only $100 million every year. And that was overly subscribed. So if we're going to be fiduciaries of finite resources, this billion dollar program, now you have these good projects that are coming out of the woodwork with all kinds of private, like a, a collection of financing, the local bond issuance, the state's putting in some money, private sector's putting in some money, uh, and you're seeing a, kind of a renaissance of the private sector getting involved. And we took the handcuffs off the states. And this Bingaman, to, uh, Bingaman Amendment that, that was mentioned earlier would have been would have been the devastator. Because it would have sent chilling effect to the Wall Street and the private sector that Absolutely. the federal government is not serious about inviting us into helping them solve their problem. Absolutely, and the private sector is capable of doing it. I, there was a, I sent around a couple articles to a few of the folks here. There was a, something that came up recently um, about the Golden Gate Bridge, famous icon, big deal, <coughs> big project in the 30s. One of the things I didn't realize, that project did not involve any federal government money. It did not involve any California state money. It was all local funding to build that bridge, which I found absolutely fascinating because I, I didn't realize that. You want to replicate that here with yeah. this bridge? No, 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 that's a good story. That's a good story. No, but the point, the <laughs> point about that tools? is, no, no, well, the, <laughs> yeah, the county 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 county. But the point about that was, is, is that you had you had, you know, it can, there are structures that can allow more public, private participation. One of the things that I've been a little concerned about is, is that the feds have basically prohibited P3s on existing thoroughfares, even when expansion is required. Yeah. I mean, we're going to have to add lane miles <coughs> on several of the interstates here in Indiana. And it's a heck of a lot easier to go to private sector and say, this, this road is handling 50,000 vehicles a day and I need to add a lane to it. And so now we need to basically pay for that and you can construct a P3 on that basis than to build a brand new road where there's no track record of, of traffic. I mean, it's just, it's kind of the difference between going to a bank and having a prospective business plan versus a an existing business with a known track record I think that I think that we're going to have to look at yeah. if we can't raise the gas tax and we can't do some of these other things then you're going to have to get back to looking at tolls and direct user fees and the only way to do that is to open it up and allow states to toll whatever they want the, 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 the in that vein, I mean I-70 between uh, Terre Haute and Indianapolis is, a, is the biggest example I can think of in the state probably Going east from Indianapolis, also, I would imagine. I don't drive that, but I drive the one between. It's two lanes. It's in horrible shape. It's probably, I don't know the numbers of vehicles traveled, but my, you might, but my, just empirically, there's a lot of vehicles on two lanes and they need, need more capacity. Uh, this does allow, you know, the bill does allow for tolling new capacity on existing, existing federal aid type thing. That I think could can be considered new capacity, which is a big deal. Which I didn't think was going to happen too. That was a huge deal. Uh, which would give you, it just basically gives flexibility, you know. Yeah. And um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things going forward that uh, I think we're going to have to look at. 
Any any other questions? If not, we really appreciate your time and uh, thank you. You all for spending some time. Thank you. Alex, thank you for coming. Hey, my pleasure. Uh, I'm just leaving some mind if anyone has any interest in intellectual property law protection.